Well, welcome to Live Your Sensual and Orgasmic Life Summit. Create a soulful and intimate connection with your partner and enjoy a full and loving life. So big welcome to you all. We have a beautiful guest with us today. And my name is Myola Woods. I'm your host, The Erotic Coach. And we are in for, I feel, a very big treat today. We have a very beautiful, sensual, what, orgasmic living, walking her talk uh, guest with us today. So let me introduce Antia Boyd, who has studied personality psychology and communications and interpersonal relationships. And now, you know, takes people into, into how to create love in an amazing, quick way. So tell us, Antia, how, how you got to be here and share such amazing work with the world. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Mayola. And yeah, everything started for me in an Eastern German household um, where I grew up to an emotionally absent mother and an emotionally absent father as well. So, and what that meant was, you know, words like, I love you, you know, or any hugs, any affection were not really welcomed in this household. You know, as a matter of fact, I was 18 months old and I was trying to crawl into my mom's bed. Now I can barely reach the, the top of the mattress at this point. And I will specifically remember my mom rolling over and saying, don't bother me. And so what that did to me, it just really shut me down. It just really made me feel my desires are not adequate. They're not appropriate. And I should just make sure I'm not a burden to anyone. And so as we all develop coping mechanisms over the years, mine was, I'm going to be Miss Independent. And I'm going to make sure I don't need anyone. I don't, never, I don't need to need for help, anything like that. And unfortunately, that was a self-denial and a lie to myself, which showed up when I started dating. Because you see, you track who you're being. Not what you say you are, but what's going on inside of you. Mm -hmm. And so guess who I attracted? I attract men who lie to themselves, who were hiding from their own authentic emotions. Mm -hmm. Also known as the emotionally unavailable men. Yes. Yes. You know, and I know you're like the erotic coach, so it's all about desire. And you know, they were suppressing their desire. I was suppressing my desire. I was making myself wrong for it. And so as a consequence, I walked myself from one disappointment to the next. Mm -hmm. Now I'm being driven with so much anticipation and anxiety. He's the one. And sometimes they told me I'm the one. And, but they would never follow up with the actions, with the action steps. They would walk the opposite direction. And it confused me so much. It left me feeling betrayed, abandoned, and rejected. And there's certainly something wrong with me. And Mayola, I always say, if you want to do something, if you want to have a different experience, you got to take massive action. Yeah. And so my massive action was getting out of Germany, getting myself into UC Berkeley, studying personality psychology, and really understanding how did this dysfunctional dynamic and entanglement that I had with my mother and a little bit with my father directly translated into that romantic dynamic I had with men. And that's when I started to unlock some keys, unlock some patterns, and started to also study, uh, do workshops, seminars. I mean, you, you name it, I did it. You know, instead of going to bars or, or clubs, I would go to some, some workshops on a weekend. And, and um, you know, and then the interesting part was I helped women find the right partner for them, just in a little setting. We just like met twice a month in a little group coaching and um, but I couldn't make it happen for myself. Mm, okay. Wow. And I said, you know, what's, what's going on? What's the blind spot here? Because I helped women, whether they were in their 30s, in their 50s, whatever ethnicity they were. And, um, and so I realized, look, you can just go so far by yourself. You can't uncover your own blind spots. Because mm -hmm. you don't even know what's reality and what's supposed to be normal. And what is your own filter that you're not aware of? So that's when I hired a mentor for myself who helped me to step into my desire without the, the fear of being weak, you know, like that vulnerability that we're always talking about. 
with, without the fear of being betrayed and taken advantage of because that's been my experience. And also to set boundaries and saying no without guilt. So I became congruent inside of myself. And quickly after, a couple of months later, I met my husband, Brody. And the first night we met, he told me that I'm the girl of the story. But not only that, he actually followed the action steps and proposed to me eight months later. So that was like a huge difference and a huge shift for me. Yeah, it's an, it's an internal journey, isn't it? For me, I resonate with the, you know, going to self-development and not the bars. And, but it's that internal change. If we want big pro, if we want big change in our life, it has to come from inwards is, is what I've always found, exactly what you're saying. So thank you, you got for it. sharing that, Antia. Mm -hmm. And that leads us beautifully into today's topic that you're going to share with us from anxiety to attraction. Three secrets why vulnerability without weakness is the ultimate magnet to your man. And I've been having lots of conversations uh, with clients and with people about vulnerability in the last couple of weeks. So it's very, it's very in my field currently. So I'm very excited about what you're going to share with us. Awesome. All right. So, yeah, I call it from anxiety to attraction because most women that come to me have extreme anxiety. They're the anxious attachment style on the spectrum. And it is like the anxious, there's the avoidant, and then there's the secure. And what happens with the anxious, you know, instead of like embracing who they are, that they have just a higher need for, and you know, they just need more acknowledgement and they just need more appreciation because they're going to the sphere they start to make themselves wrong for it. Mm. And as a matter of fact, so many walk the opposite direction and pretend that they're not that interested in the man because they're afraid that the man, he's like, oh, if the man could just only find out that I think about him every five minutes. I'm not going to text him back right away. I'm going to text him back in like about a few hours, right? And, but what happens is you send mixed signals. So it's not going to help you. And suddenly man can pick it up. You know, my husband always tells me this all the time. He's like, we men don't know, but we know when something is off, even if we don't know what it is. So mm -hmm. men are actually much more intuitive than we give them credit for, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's really about leaning into your anxiety and seeing what's, what is anxiety and what is vulnerability? Because that's really like linked together, right? Because, you know, women that come to me, when they hear the word vulnerability, they think about anxiety they think about their worst fears, mm -hmm. you know, and instead of like stepping away from them and trying to not be them, I always invite them to lean into them. Mm -hmm. I was like, what if you would play it all out? Everything that your anxiety wants you to do, you know, and, and to really see what's actually behind that. But most women don't even get to uncover that what's behind it because they're, they're resisting it. You know, it's like a little girl saying, mommy, mommy, I want your attention. And you're just like, shh, you know, don't, don't talk. You're too crazy, you know? And so you never get to hear what is the message? What's the gift? What's the gold? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And often, and I think I'm going to gender. I don't like to, but yeah, you know, I think particularly for both of us, you know, men and women or boys and girls, you know, girls are probably allowed to be a bit louder, but they're often shushed and boys are not allowed to be kind. They're not allowed to cry and they're not allowed yeah. to be that kind of emotional. So we're, I think we're all kind of uh, hushed on a, on, a, on a very deep level that we don't realise then what happens when, we're, when we want to date and we want to find our partner that all those little things come up for healing, for awareness, for noticing so that we can, you know, not have to keep playing those patterns out. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, what so many women don't even know is that how anxiety is really their gift is because when you are at your deepest vulnerable core, you're actually at the point of creation. So if you can manage to stay there without wanting to bounce off, you can stay in the heat basically, right? Because that's when metal can be remelted and turned into something else. But you have to stay in the heat because then you're at the most vulnerable, you're actually at the most powerful manifestation point. Mm -hmm. So if you can get yourself to stay in that emotional super rawness and super feeling inadequate, shame, all of those emotions that we're really trying to run away from, and you simply stay with them without making them mean anything, then you can actually create, and you create a catapult 
like that that accelerates your manifestation path why because that is the only moment where the survival mechanism doesn't have any filters because it's at survival already so it doesn't have any filters that keeps you from going deeper well if you're just like life is good you know and you're trying to manifest things you are actually going to experience filters you actually experience like a, a doubtful voice inside of yourself or a realistic voice inside of yourself right not so much when you're already at your most vulnerable point so women don't know that so if they knew that this is the biggest secret this is the most powerful moment that when you feel shame oh, wow what can i do with that like just staying in that and and facing it and seeing now you're unstoppable because you're not reacting to it yes when we can sit in that that's why I, I that's why I said it again when we can sit in that heat in that fire in that uh, rawness is when things change things and yeah. I think as a society we are told that confusion is no good and anxiety is no good and frustration is no good. We don't, haven't been told or taught how to harness them for our benefit to know that, you know, when we're anxious, there's something going on and we're confused. We're, we're looking for those neurological pathways are trying to create something different and it's actually something to be, you know, excited about. But mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of told, well, you shouldn't be confused. You should just know everything and everything should be smooth and beautiful all the time. Absolutely. You're so right about that. It's like, you know, Tony Robbins always says, you're confused. And we're all applauding, right? Because it's fantastic. You know, you're rewiring your brain. And I also, what I always see in my uh, magnetized the mentality calls with my women is there's always usually one emotion. It's usually sadness or anger. Yeah. that they're resisting. That's always one of my first questions. And that's one of the tips for the women who are listening. Which emotion are you resisting? For whatever reason, right? Your dad told you, you know, like you got to be strong or, or you just, or you just observed, um, you know, your mom being sad. So maybe you can't go into anger. And it's that like your job is, and then usually what happens. So first I tell you what happens is, you know, what we do is if we don't own that emotion, you know, we pop out. We we just say, you know, like we literally leave our body and we laugh. We laugh. We're leaving our body. We're not staying in the body. We're not staying in the heat, right? And I can always identify and I always say, you know, this this was a very heavy moment that you just described, and it's hard for me to believe that that makes you laugh, right? That's that's really painful. And and then when we go deeper, you know, like we really see that this is like the biggest resistance point that doesn't allow men to come in because as soon as they get closer to intimacy, they're like, Oh, I'm good. I'm, you know, I don't need to express that or I don't need that help or I don't want to feel as soon as I get close to that kind of emotion, I'm backing off. It's same with sadness, right? Same with sadness. I have like very strong women. I good with anger, but you know, sadness or grief. They're like, I'm never going to stop. I'm like, actually, that's not true. If you feel fully the grief without stories, without images around it, then you just allow that feeling to move through you. It actually moves fast. It moves usually within a couple of minutes. Yes. If you focus just on that and you let go of that, you know, victim story that we sometimes want to create. I'm the bigger victim. I should get more attention, right? Because of course there's secondary gains while we're like suffering, you know, while we're emotionally suffering, while we're creating our self-fulfilling prophecies over and over again. So the, the journey is really to go into your anger and be like, ah! and just like be with it versus laughing, right? And it just opens something up. It just opens something up. It, it might make you cry. It might make you have an image that comes out of right now. You know, it's so interesting if you're able to stay in that emotion without laughing. Mm -hmm. without running away, without, without minimizing it mm -hmm. and advocating for that, not just doing it once, but doing it over and over again. Or when somebody criticizes you, yeah, I'm angry right now. I feel anger versus, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. You know, I didn't want to bother you. It's, you know, never mind, right? Because that's what we oftentimes do. Like the women who get themselves to the point, 
then they start to apologize. Yeah. Yeah. So we say, I'm sorry, instead of owning what I'm actually feeling. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think once we have experienced feeling things to the, you know, as much as we can in their totality, it then becomes a little bit easier instead of trying to hold them down. But until we've kind of had a few experiences, we still think this holding down is hiding something from someone. We don't know who, but it's hiding it from, from someone. And, and I see that at all levels. You know, uh, this year I spoke, I was keynote speaker at Google. And, you know, the high, high level employees there, you know, just everybody had their own fear. Everybody had their own vulnerability. But I opened it up and I said, you know, I just want to share my own vulnerability. I've never spoken in corporate before. I feel really uncomfortable right now. And so it's really about it's time for us to embody that and not to just like teach it, but to actually look what's our vulnerability. How can we be raw and authentic and transparent? Because just like saying, okay, well, the, um, the definition of vulnerability is this and that, okay, that's not going to do it because that's what I did for years. I intellectualized everything and that's why I helped everyone else because they actually embodied it and I didn't. So that's like a big blind spot for women because I hear all the time, I've done all those workshops and I work with this person and that person. And I said, well, it doesn't matter because it depends on your implementation, right? But you, yeah, exactly. Integration. Are you taking it in? Yes. Yes. Yes, there's one, there's one, you know, one level of bringing it into the mind and then there's one, another level of bringing it into the body and bringing it into how we be. In the yes, world. yes. Yeah, and even bringing it into the pussy too. Like yeah. all the way down from like through the throat, the voice. Are you using, is your voice congruent with what you're saying or are you saying something angry but you sound like a mouse, yeah. right? And so you're actually not congruent in your heart and your gut. Like all of it, you know, I really feel like to really check where is your, uh, you know, your threshold, where do you stop, when do you start popping out, you know, and that's, that's really the practice is to take, we, you know, Mary Williamson said, we have experienced enough information. Now it's time for transformation. Okay. So Antia, how might we recognize that we're popping out? Well, you laugh. Okay. You get away from it. You make yourself wrong for the emotion. Usually you laugh. I mean, I would say 95% of women that I see, there's a chuckle, there's a laugh, there's an apology. There's a kind of like a backing off. The voice changes, right? Um, laughter usually, 95%, it, it is laughter. It is laughter. Okay. Because there's no other way, right? Because laughter is like intense. It's like a release. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so the job is to increase the capacity inside of yourself to say, I'm safe. See, that's a good tool to simply say, I'm safe. After you're angry, just like, so ha, 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 I'm safe. I'm safe. And, I didn't get, and, then, and I didn't get into trouble. That's when I, you know, I'm still here. I'm still, I'm still here. I'm still alive. I'm, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and trust me, I know what I, uh, what I teach. I was at a, at a joint venture, um, you know, sort of like conference and everybody was speaking in the microphone and I just, I just was like a little, not bored, but you know, I was like, nobody's embodied here. Right. So I just grabbed the mic and it's like, wake up. And uh, it, it just shook up everyone, you know, and it's, it shook up my own body. And so that's what, that's the gift that we women have is if we really go there, what would happen if you just, you know, even if you just take one day per week, so don't, you know, if it's like too much for you, if you're like, I can't even imagine doing this, just have, take a girlfriend and say, you know what, help me that once a week, I'm going to express one emotion that I'm really resisting, yeah. you know, identify it together and say, you know, usually your friends are really good at that. They can tell, you know, every time when this happened, you never seem to be sad. You're always happy. You know, friends are really good. I was like, can you do me a favor? Can you do, like, you know, kind of like ask deeper questions when I'm happy the next time, but you feel like there's more. So ask your friends for help and build some sort of accountability around it. You know, ideally, of course, you have a mentor who's been there, done that. But that's the first good step to have someone who, so sometimes it's a family member. It doesn't work so well because it really depends on the family entanglements 
and they might have their own triggers around your empowerment. So that's why usually I recommend more friends that are like-minded. Yes, yes. I have a couple of good friends and we're very able to take things deeply with each other and ask those questions that maybe other people are not allowed to ask so much. Um, right, yeah. right. Oh. It's like, Mayola, I don't know. I didn't really buy that. Yes. There's something else. What's going on? Are you, are, right? you, are you in your body when you're answering that? Or are you, have you, where have you gone? Are you here or not here? Where are you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. That accountability. What do you say? Is it is that accountability? Accountability. Well, yeah. you know, my friend asking me this question and I go, oh, God, where am I? Oh, okay. Maybe I'm not here. Maybe I need to go in and have a look deeper of what's going on here for me. Absolutely. Well, there's so much power in being witnessed. Mm. Have someone, one person that really witnesses you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't have that, get yourself in some accountability system, in some kind of group program, mastermind, where you have accountability. Without, without accountability, you're not going to make it because you're not aware of it. You know, we delete, we distort, and we generalize reality all day long based on our unconscious expectations. You have no shot, no shot. I don't care how much willpower you have. I don't care how much you meditate because our brain is just so much smarter, so much more like, um, you know, what's eloquent, I almost want to say, sophisticated, right? Multi-layered. And so without somebody witnessing you from the outside and observing you, it's, you know, like you're, you're going to just continue to listen to interviews and 20 years later, you're still single while you walk all of your, watch all your other friends walk down the aisle or be in a happy, fully committed and fulfilled relationship. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, there's the action step. And I really liked that in your introduction when you said, the men had given you the words of you are my, you are my woman. You are, you are the one for me, but they didn't follow with the actions. And yeah, the husband said the words and then followed with actions. And yeah. I think that's really important. I think, well, for everyone, but that we know ourselves as well, that we follow our actions, but also yeah. other people. You know, and where are they? Are they following their words and are they? Um, so did you have an action list or was it just that he just, he followed and he was actually walking his talk? How did you know that his actions were, were congruent with what he was saying? Oh, I think one part for me was I realized that when a man was like really into me, he almost became like, either really anxious, like really like overbearing, just kind of crazy, you know, want to marry me next week, basically. Um, that's the vi most vibration. Or they were completely like backing off. They said something big and now they're kind of gone. And my husband was just consistent. He was just like, I just made a statement. It's kind of like saying, you know, I have brown hair. Okay, big deal. And he just went his life. He, he, he continued his life, but he, you know, he called me very consistently twice a week not crazy you know just like he i have my life we're getting to know each other you know like my first impression said you're the one and now let's see when we deepen it if that's true right basically that was the vibration very secure he's been very consistent and there was also not all this texting i have this whole opportunity with texting and never calling and and he would only text and say i call you at three and then only there, he would also just talk for a few minutes with me because he would just say, okay, let's meet tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow doesn't work. Let's do Friday. So it was all action, action, action. There were not a lot of words, right? Mm -hmm. I was really realize, realizing the difference there, you know? Um, and then, of course, like a couple of um, weeks later, he told me that he has feelings of love for me. So he just like kept deepening. And he never, he never backed off. He never acted weird or like he didn't answer the phone or anything like that. He was just very consistent, very consistent. And it does, it's not the, about the amount. It's about the consistency. You rather have a man who calls you twice a week than have a man who calls you almost every day the first three weeks and then nothing. Yes. Right? So that's, that's what, that was a big thing. That was definitely a big thing for me. And then the other pieces, that's more for men. But um, one day I tried to kind of like, you know, seduce him, go over early to his place and things like that. And he said, you know, I work until five. So again, very much integrity. 
right? And he was an entrepreneur, so he can make his own hours. But he had this promise to, to himself, and that made me trust him. That made me trust him because I knew he would not walk out of his way to please me. Because, yeah, my ego wanted that, but secretly, I didn't want that. Yeah. I wanted a man who puts me in my place. I wanted a man who I can trust, who has his own life, who has his own goals, right? And who can take the emotions from me because I'm very fiery and I have a lot of temper. And for him, it was no matter what happened, he was like a fence. Imagine a fence, like my anger would just like go through the fence and the fence is still standing, right? I mean, if there's a storm, like the, you know, the fence is still standing there, right? And so that's the experience that I had with my husband. And then the last piece that I really want to mention for women is to really find someone you can be transparent with. Yeah. Like where you can really say, what's your deepest, darkest fear? You know, what's something you don't want anybody to know, especially when we're anxious, we don't want to share that. You know, we're like, oh, good. Oh, you didn't identify that I'm anxious, you know, and uh, versus saying, look, my deepest, darkest fear is that I'm not good enough. Right. Or my husband said at the, our shadow ceremony the night before our wedding, you know, um, I'm afraid to get trapped, to lose my freedom. And so getting to that level, and we spoke about it at Harvard um, a few months ago. Like we talked about that power couples on purpose, what it really takes, that it's not easy, but it's real, it's raw, it's authentic. And that's what makes it lasting. Yeah. Because that's what we women want. So many women will come to me, they don't have problems to attracting the man. But the problem is to keep that juice, to keep that attraction. And that means keep leaning into that anxiety, go what you feel most afraid of and run towards it. Yes. share it yes. with him. Yes. Right? Yes. I always say, say that thing you don't want to say. That thing. That, that one there. The one. <laughs> yes, right? Exactly. Exactly. You, okay. Well, you don't know what to do. You have to say it. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Not, not the one that your mind wants to create. No, 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 no. The one that you don't want to say. That one that is, you know, yeah, in here. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been, you know, insightful for, to see how I think we get caught in our mind as well in dating and we think it has to look like something and it has to have all of this, these pretenses out here, but it's a different strategy to change it from the inside out. So in bringing us to a close into how do you, what do you think people's biggest resistance is to being vulnerable or saying those things that they want to keep hidden. Yeah. Yeah. And working with over, over a thousand women worldwide now and really all ethnicities, all ages, yeah. it's, it's really this part inside of us that we already talked about it. It's like speak the unspoken. So if you just write yourself a note, speak the unspoken, like everything that you don't speak, but it creates that little space in between you. Or look, what are you afraid to be found out as? Oh. We we'll always have something that we're afraid to be found out as. And you know what? That thing is actually not as bad as that whole behavior that people find really suspicious if you're like just have the shame around something. Yeah. Usually the shame around that thing that you're so embarrassed about is way worse yeah. than the actual yeah. whatever it is. You know, whatever, like maybe you had a career you're not proud of. or I mean, whatever it is, your upbringing you know, like your secret fear, right? Um, or your secret fantasy. You know, it, it doesn't have to be negative. It could also be positive. Yes. And you can also judge yourself for something positive because you're afraid that it's too much, it's too edgy, right? So that's what I would say. It's really, um, my husband always says, what does he say? Enter the, the cave, um, seek the cave of darkness, something like that, that the gold is in the cave. I, I forgot exactly what it is, but um, it's basically like go into that cave yeah. where that fear's in it because there's actually gold. Yeah. Yep. Treasure. That's where the treasure is. Yep. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's probably not in the, in the wide open space with the light on. You probably already know that one. There's the one that's hidden in the cave. It's correct. Yeah. You know, you know, and that's, that's where you need support. Yeah. Like getting over yourself, getting over your fears, your filters, your ego to express that. We yeah. all know. We yeah. all know. I have 
I've not met one person that doesn't know Mayola. No, it's true. It's true. And I, and I think we sometimes have resistance to getting help with our love life or our intimate life because we're, we're kind of given the idea we're supposed to know it all. How would we know? I mean, I don't, I don't know many people that have had relationship education or intimate education or sex education or other than, you know, our, in Australia, our sex education is sort of biology. You know, it's not, it's not about pleasure or... Um, right. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Any of those sorts of things. It's about, you know, disease and don't get pregnant is really what it's about. Um, right. But right. so we don't have it. So, but when we were, if we were, often when we think about our children, we would get them a coach in a flash. We would mm -hmm. get them a sports coach or a tutor or uh, we would get them in a flash. We, oh. would know that we would know they need help in an area and we would, but we don't always turn that into ourselves that, you know, our, mm -hmm. that we need some help. And absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, women are the worst taking care of the inner girl. The absolute worst. They'd rather step into a warrior rest or some other parts that are really beneficial in society. But when it comes to the inner girl, which that was what it means, right? That would be like listening to the inner girl and listen to her wisdom, to her creativity, and then overcoming that shame that we're like inadequate or whatever we need to heal. You know, that's absolutely that's it. You know, what would you tell your inner girl? Or what would you tell your best friend if you can get yourself there? Like if you had your best friend, would you say stay in this relationship and call him another time and expose yourself to this anxiety and, and, and this disrespect for behavior, right? Or would you walk? Would you tell her to walk yeah. and to respect herself, right? Absolutely. Yes. I think that, yes, we could take advice that we would give to our friends yeah. and, and that inner girl, what we would tell, what we would tell to have uh, respect and, and lean into. I really like that, the leaning into anxiety and ah, really like yeah. leaning in. So there's not, there's not the running away from and hiding. There's the leaning in and feeling more of and, and using it as a tool for expansion and yeah. to temporarize change. I really. Mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. Yeah, fear is the only thing that gets smaller when the, move, the closer you move. It's like a spider, right? The spider's really tiny, but then you get close and it swings the web. But it's a freaking spider when you get closer, right? It's so tiny, you can crush it. And so that's basically what anxiety is. It, that's really what anxiety is, is the spider swinging like crazy, making itself look bigger. Mm. And more erratic too, because it's like this erratic motion. Mm. And, and that's anxiety. Yeah, I like that. That's good. I like that. And you've got a special offer for the viewers of a complimentary session where they can ask you a bunch of questions and get to some answers on how you might assist them in being, you know, moving from anxiety to attraction. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's really about breaking through the specific blind spots and filters I mentioned before that we all have, but they're all different to make that distinctions to break through that and to create a system that works for you, that it's not just about information, what we said before, that it really starts to integrate. Because only when it's integrated does it show up in your reality. True. Thank you very much, Andrea, for joining us today. We've, I've learned so much, and I know our viewers have, you know, have gained lots of insights and starting to have those conversations with their, you know, with their girlfriends. They might ring and say, I really need to talk to you about my emotions. Yeah. Every world where everyone spoke of with about their emotions, we would we would live on a very different planet. So thank you. Oh, very much. Absolutely, I agree. Thank you for having me, Mayola. So thank you for joining us on the Live Your Sensual and Orgasmic Life Summit. We stay tuned for some more fantastic interviews, more of those conversations that we don't have, those taboo subjects. I'm Mayola Woods, the erotic coach. Thank you. <laughs>